Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk about the ability to stop and start my Azure Kubernetes service clusters, my AKS clusters. This could be useful for test dev scenarios where, hey, I have a cluster, I'm doing some testing, but then I don't need it for a period of time. So I can actually stop it and stop paying for it. And even production, hey, I have quiet times, I could stop the cluster and stop paying. So I want to get into really how this works. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share is appreciated, and hit that bell icon to get notified when I have new content. Now, if I think about the components of an AKS cluster, so you have essentially the management, the control plane. So that's where we have things like the etcd database, where it's actually storing the state. I have things like the cube API server, that's my kind of interactions actually with perform management operations. I have things like the cube scheduler. So this is responsible for, hey, are there pods that need to be scheduled somewhere? Then there's a whole bunch of different controllers. Um, I can think about, well, there's controllers for nodes, jobs, endpoints, accounts, tokens, all those various things. Now, all of these components, when I think about the Azure Kubernetes service, this is essentially PaaS. I don't really see these. Now, there is a free option for this kind of management plane where I don't get an SLA, but I get an SLO, a service level objective. So we get that kind of 99.5 SLO. And then there are paid versions where I can actually get an SLA. Now that might be 99.95 or 99.9, .9, depending on if I'm using AZs or not AZs. So there's a certain dollar cost there for that management plane if I'm not using the free variety. And then we actually have to have workloads running somewhere. So what we then have are node pools. So I can think about, hey, I have node pools now, I'm always going to have a system mode node pool. So I can think about, well, it's a node pool, but it's mode system. And that node pool can have one or more actual nodes within it. And they kind of run the kubelet, which enables it to go and talk to the kube API to actually get the various instructions. Now, if I look at that, on that system node pool, if we actually jump over for a second, we see it's actually running a number of core pods for Kubernetes to function. So if I go and look at my Kubernetes service, if I go and look at my node pools, what we can actually see over here is, yes, I have this system node pool mode right here. And I can see currently where well, I have two nodes in there. You can see the count number here. And if I actually look at the workloads, so I'm using the workloads tab, I can see all these different deployments of services. I can look at the pods, and I can see all of these different pods associated with the cube system namespace. I can see various types of metrics and core DNS, all these core things. I also see gatekeeper system. That's for things like the Azure policy for Kubernetes. So I have all these various workloads actually running in the environment. So I have to have these, and that's kind of a core component. Now, this node pool is actually built on a virtual machine scale set. That's something I configure when I actually create the cluster. So if I go and add a new Kubernetes cluster, as part of the node pools, you can say, hey, enable virtual machine scale sets. And you really want this. The virtual machine scale sets is going to let me do things like auto scale. I can have multiple node pools. I have Windows support. It's going to also enable other things like rolling updates. It gives me the availability zone. So there's a whole set of good features. So you're going to want to use that. Now, I'm going to point something out, a negative <laughs> demonstration. Yes, you can actually see them as virtual machine scale sets. I can see my various node pools over here. Never ever interact with them via virtual machine scale sets. Always interact via AKS. Bad things can kind of happen if I go and play around directly um, against the VMSS. So always do my management actually against the Kubernetes system. And even within 
that system node pool, I can still have applications. So I've got kind of my, my bad father web application I created. I can see two pods for that that I have actually deployed to that particular environment. So I can see all my different details over here. So that's my kind of system node pool. Now, additionally, I can have additional node pools. I could add other node pools, which are mode user. So I can have a, a user node pool kind of one. And the reason I might do that is I could have different types of nodes. Maybe, for example, I'm using a GPU SKU in this particular pool. Maybe I have another pool over here that is using, could be a compute. Maybe I'm using spot VMs to get super cheap pricing. And what I do is I set kind of a taint on the node pool, different taints. Maybe this one is saying, hey, GPU. This one is saying, hey, spot. And then in my YAML deployment, I can set various tolerances to say, hey, I'm going to tolerate, hey, our GPU, tolerate spot. So when my deployments land, they land in the right place. So I have those capabilities. Also, these different node pools can actually run different versions of Kubernetes. I think I can go three versions back, actually, from what the actual cluster itself is doing. So if we actually look at my cluster, we can see, well, yeah, I have two node pools. So I'm paying for those. Now, for those various node pools, I can absolutely, for the user ones, or I could just scale it. I could scale it to zero. And essentially then I'm going to stop paying for that, for that particular node pool. Now notice there is the auto scale option. In Kubernetes we have the horizontal pod auto scaling. So that's really all about the idea that, hey, those pods that are landing, I could set things about maybe metrics, maybe requests per second, and it can add instances between a minimum and maximum number then I have the cluster autoscaler that adds and removes nodes that is purely based on the cube scheduler and is it waiting to actually deploy pods. And if it's got pods it wants to deploy but can't, that's when the cluster autoscheduler, if it's built on BMSS, would go and add nodes to the node pool so it can then go and schedule those pods. So if I want to reduce my costs, yes, user nodes, I could reduce to zero in those user node pools. But the system node pool, I could reduce to one. So absolutely, I could actually go in and I could reduce my cost by saying, hey, system node pool, uh, not upgrade, I am going to scale you to one. But notice it won't let me drag it to zero. I can only reduce it to one. So my minimum cost here would be, sure, I could scale this to one in my system node pool, but maybe I'm also still paying. If I'm using the paid with an SLA, I'm still going to be paying for that as well. So the whole point now is I can stop it. Providing I am using that VMSS-based cluster, I can actually say, stop the cluster. Now, I can stop it for up to 12 months and it will maintain the state. So when I start it again, my applications that were running will get burst back into life. Those deployments will be back there again. Uh, over 12 months, and it's gonna go away. When it stopped, the only thing I can do is start it. I can't do scale operations, I can't do deployments against it, it stopped. So if it stopped, I can start it, and then I can do actions against it. So let's actually see this. Now, the stop at the moment, I go to my overview, there's no kind of stop action from within here. But what I'm going to do is open up kind of the cloud shell, and I'm just going to use the AZ. So I can do an AZ, so let's jump here, AZ, AKS, and I could list output to table. And I can see I've got kind of two clusters right now. And what I want to do is stop this first one. Now remember, right now, if I was to look at the node pools, I have two nodes in my system, one in this user node. I never shrunk it to zero. So at this point, I'm going to do an AZ, AKS stop. My name is AKS US South Central CNI1 dash dash resource 
whoop, rg-aks. So I'm saying, go ahead and stop that cluster. Now I could add dash dash no dash wait to it if I didn't want to wait for this. But this is actually now going to go and stop that cluster. So if I kind of hit refresh, notice the node counts are zero already. So it's actually now gone and it's removed all the nodes from that. So essentially I'm stopping pain. I can see the provisioning state is actually stopping. And maybe if I actually go and look at my workloads, my pods, this is gonna catch up in a second. They're stopping right now, but these will all kind of terminate down and essentially my cluster will be stopped. So I need to wait for this to finish. But the key thing I'm gonna see is, yes, the node counts are obviously gonna to drop to zero um, for these. And I'll be able to actually check, is it really stopped? Because the power state, you can see the status is actually showing me as stopping here in the portal as well. And that will actually change and I'll be able to actually check that from the AZ uh, AKS as well. Okay, so that is now finished. And we can check, well, is it really stopped? So firstly, if we go back and look at the node pools, remember? Yep, we see that zero provisioning state succeeded. But I can also look at that cluster. So if I do an AZ AKS show, What I'm really looking at here is the power state. And what we can see is code stopped, which is really what I care about. And if I did actually go and look at the virtual machine scale set for these particular clusters, you can see, hey, yeah, look, the number of instances are all zero. So that VMSS is not running either. So that's kind of how easy it is to stop, and I'm now not paying for that. I'm not paying for any nodes or anything else. So let's just reverse that action, and now we'll do a start. And what we'll see is it will kind of, I'm gonna do the dash dash no wait, so I get my command prompt back. So now it's gone off and it's triggering the start. Now, if I am using the cluster autoscaler, be aware that when it comes back to life, the number of nodes may not actually match what it was before, but it will go and work out what it should be. It will kind of steady out. But the initial start, it may not exactly match. So what it's doing now with the start is obviously it's all these things are springing to life. It's looking at what that save state was and then bringing back the various node pools and the deployments actually on the nodes. So if we go back and actually have a look at what it's doing, let's minimize that down. While I'm in the VM scale sets, I guess we could have a quick look. So that's still zero, so it's not spun those up yet. It's probably doing the actual cluster components first. But then what we'll actually see for the Kubernetes service, because it's starting here. And the first thing we'll be looking for is kind of the node pools. So it knows it wants to get to kind of that two and the one. So it's gonna go ahead and start those. And then once those nodes are started, then it can actually go and start thinking about the various workloads. Now, those namespaces won't exist yet. I wouldn't expect this is probably gonna error. But once those nodes are actually up and running and it rehydrates the state, I would expect to see all of those back, not just those system pods, but I should see, remember those two bad fathers I had for my custom app that I also had deployed. Yeah, I would expect this because it's not there yet but I would also get back those two I had actually in that system node pool. So again, let's give this a minute to actually finish starting up. So it's still starting right now. If I hit kind of refresh on that, if I look at my node pools, they still show us starting. If I was nosy, look at my VM scale sets, you can actually see, hey look, that must be the system node pool, AKS agent pool. My user pool, that's still starting up. It's one node. So I can see things kind of kicking off, um, actually working behind the scenes. And then once again, all of those different node pools are up, then it will go and rehydrate the actual deployments it had. So I'll get, so that's now succeeded. 
So it's saying I've got my two and one. If I look at my workloads, well there I can see all the workloads, and there's my bad father web one, so my guess is it's still actually kind of deploying a few things, unless maybe it's scaled down. So there's not a huge number of things here. Oh, that's my deployment. Let's look at my pods. There you go, I'm making a mistake. So there's bad father. There's one of mine over there. And there's the other one. So it has rehydrated the state as well. So at this point, so it says succeeded. And once again, if we went and now looked at a show, we look at our power state. Well, our power state now shows as running. So that that was really it. Um, not super complicated, but as you can see, we now have that ability that if I don't need my cluster running all the time and I want to optimize my cost, yes, optimizing my cost if things do need to run all the time, hey, use the horizontal pod auto scaling to change the number of pods based on workload, then the cluster auto scale to change the number of actual nodes running. But if I don't need it at all, well, now I can actually go and stop the AKS cluster for up to 12 months. And then it takes a few minutes to stop and it takes a few minutes to start. I could automate that. I could create a function or a logic app, whatever I wanted to do that stop and start when I need it, or just as you saw, do it manually. So I hope that was useful. Uh, until next video, take care.